הזוכה בפרס בלוואטניק לשנת 2024 בתחום מדעי הפיזיקה וההנדסה הוא פרופסור תומאס וידיק. פרופסור וידיק נבחר לקבל את הפרס על מחקר חלוצי שבחן שימוש בעקרונות קוונטים לבניית מחשבים עוצמתיים יותר. עבודתו של פרופסור וידיק היא אבן דרך חשובה במסע שלנו להבנת כוחו במגבלותיו של המחשוב הקוונטי, ותקדם את הבטחת התקשורת הדיגיטלית. ההרצאה תהיה באנגלית, אנו נצפה בסרטון קצר על תומאס, ואחר כך הוא יישא את הרצאתו בנושא Certifying Quantum Randomness. As a scientist, what I value most is the freedom to choose the problems that I think are most important and that I am going to devote my time to. My name is Thomas Vidik and I'm professor of computer science at the Weizmann Institute of Science. The kind of questions that I try to understand is the power of quantum computers and their use for secure communication and cryptography. Quantum computers are computers that use the phenomena of quantum mechanics in order to achieve certain computational tasks faster. In my research, I studied one of the most interesting quantum phenomena that can be used, power of entanglement in interactive proof systems. So what's an interactive proof system? Think of it as a dialogue between two different persons. One of the persons is trying to convince the other of a certain claim. However, the trick is that they might be lying. Now, in a multi-proof interactive proof system, there's multiple people trying to demonstrate the claim. Because there's many of them, we can ask them related questions and check their answers against each other. This is what makes the power of multi-proof interactive proofs. In my research, we add another ingredient to this classic framework. We showed that by adding entanglement, the verification power of multi-prover interactive proof systems is greatly increased. Entanglement is a quantum mechanical effect that allows the multiple parties to correlate their answers together. This is an important discovery for the foundations of computation because it relates two very different computational models. Studying these phenomena using a computational mindset allows us to ask many new questions about it that lead to important insights. Honestly, the work I do is very hard and it's not always very accessible. Getting this kind of recognition, the Blavatnik Award, is a very rare honor. I felt very proud. The advice I would give to younger scientists is don't give up and make sure to keep the smile on. There will always be new questions. Solving each challenge contributes a tiny bit in our understanding of the world and opens up a whole new world of questions to study. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. <clears throat> my presentation is going to be in English. Uh, my, my Hebrew is nowhere near as good uh, to make the jump right now, so um, I hope it's okay. Uh, it's really nice to be here and uh, see all of you here, especially the students who made the trip, so uh, you're very brave, and I hope you're enjoying the day and, uh, and you get something out of it. Uh, so I'm a computer scientist. Uh, I work at the Weizmann Institute of Science, um, and my field is quantum computing. The idea for quantum computing is to uh, leverage uh, physical phenomena, specifically for some phenomena that are described by quantum, quantum mechanics, uh, in order to achieve uh, faster uh, computation. Uh, so for the sake of illustration, for the purposes of my talk, I'm going to focus on one specific aspect, uh, which is randomness. So first, before we get there, a little bit about quantum computing. So as I mentioned, uh, the idea is to harness the laws of physics to achieve uh, faster computation, uh, secure communication, and also more efficient uh, networks. So the feature that I'll focus on, randomness. So if you, if you take classical Newtonian mechanics, this is a completely deterministic theory. Uh, in principle, if you know the initial conditions, you can predict what is going to happen. If you know this entire state of the world at a certain moment, you can predict when the apple will fall, what will be its acceleration, what will be its velocity, and when it will hit uh, the ground. This may be difficult to do uh, in practice, but in theory, it's feasible. Quantum mechanics is different. It's inherently random. Uh, here you have a picture or rendition of uh, Schrodinger's cat, uh, which is in the superposition of being alive and dead. Uh, the prediction of quantum mechanics is that when you observe the cat, you will see either alive with 50% chance or dead uh, with 50% uh, chance. Uh, this randomness in the outcome of the observation that you make 
uh, is not a result uh, of any uncertainty that you have about the state of the cat. You know entirely what the state of the cat is, but this state is a superposition of being alive and dead. This is a complete description of its state, and when you make an observation, the state collapses to either alive or dead. We don't observe superpositions, we observe definite, uh, definite states. Uh, this uh, uh, intrinsic randomness in quantum mechanics uh, famously bothered uh, Einstein, uh, who didn't like it at all. Um, he thought that uh, this, this randomness must be a result of a incompleteness of the rules of quantum mechanics, that there must be some variable that we don't know about yet, but that if we knew it, we would be able to say, is the cat going to be alive or is the cat going to be dead? Um, so Einstein came up with all kinds of thought experiments uh, using which he aimed to demonstrate that uh, the randomness could be removed. It led to absurdities. Uh, however, all of these thought, thought experiments were over time resolved favorably, and the uh, ir irreconcilable randomness uh, in, in quantum mechanics is now a, a well-accepted fact. So the question now is how is this randomness useful for computation? Uh, we as computer scientists are used to thinking of randomness as a resource. It's a bit like time, or space, uh, you also have randomness. Randomness is a critical resource for algorithms. It's critical for secret communication. There would be no cryptography. There would be no blockchain or any such things without randomness. Uh, it's essential to certain tasks in distributed computation. Uh, in fact, I can't resist uh, showing you a picture of uh, Avi Victorson, uh, who's a very famous Israeli uh, computer scientist, currently at the IES in Princeton. And uh, Avi received the, the Turing Award just a couple months ago. Turing Award is uh, the equivalent of the Nobel Prize for computer scientists. And he received the Turing Award for his work in changing how we perceive uh, randomness in, uh, in, in computation. All right, so at this point, uh, we've understood that uh, randomness is a useful resource for computation. Uh, that uh, classical physics, classical mechanics doesn't allow to produce randomness because it's deterministic whereas quantum mechanics does allow uh, to produce it. So how do we use that? Um, well, here's a very simple uh, description of uh, a quantum circuit. Uh, this is a quantum circuit that, you know, you might not be able to parse this. What's, what's important about it is that it's entirely deterministic. These are fixed actions that I can perform, but these fixed actions result in the probabilistic outcome. The output is zero, probably 50%, one, probably 50%. Uh, if you don't like descriptions of circuits, if you're not a computer scientist, the physical layer, what's depicted here is very simple. Uh, you just imagine a laser. This laser is beaming photons one at a time at a mirror, and the mirror is sending the photons uh, to the left with probability 50% and to the right with probability 50%. I'm slightly simplifying here. Uh, what's important is that the mirror is in a fixed position, the laser is doing a fi fixed thing, and yet the outcome that you observe is, is, is random. So you can build the simplest quantum computer out of it, out of this, and uh, in fact, this is something that that is done. Uh, so you have um, you know, companies, startups. Here's an example from Ide Quantique that put the laser inside the box, and they sell this box uh, on the internet as a quantum random number generator. Uh, in fact, I, I have such a box in my office. You can get it for a couple thousand uh, uh, shekels. And um, so the question that I want to ask about this now is, assuming that you bought this box that generates random numbers, and suppose that you're a casino owner and you want to use these random numbers in order to determine the outcome of the, you know, the roulette tosses, or maybe assume that you're someone willing to engage in secure communication, um, are you going to use the box or not? And uh, you know, at the risk of lowering the scientific level of, the, of this uh, conference, let me show you a little cartoon um, and give you a second to read it. Um, so this cartoon demonstrates the difficulty of verifying this specific process that I chose uh, for, for, my, uh, for my presentation, which is the generation of randomness. Right? You give an access to the device. This device is supposed to generate random bits. You press the on button. It generates a stream of zeros. Was that random or not? Now you can be a bit suspicious if you see a sequence of zeros, but then the sequence of zeros is just as likely as a sequence of nines, which is just as likely as a sequence of, you know, zero, one, two, three, or whatever. Uh, so what can you do about it? Um, so I want to explain uh, in the remaining time that I have, give you an idea of how you can use quantum mechanics itself, but the second phenomenon in quantum mechanics in order to certify this generation of randomness. I want you to keep in mind that this is just an example, uh, but similar ideas can be used to certify a way more complex uh, phenomenon uh, that are based on quantum mechanics. So the ingredient that I need to introduce is, is called entanglement. 
So entanglement is a state of matter. Uh, what you have here pictured on the, on the slide are coupled particles. You can think of these as photons, which are particles of light, but they could be also be electrons or other kinds of particles. Uh, what's important is that these particles were initialized in a strongly correlated state. Uh, this correlation between them is symbolized by the wave. So now the wave is nothing physical. It's just a symbol that I represent, I used to represent on the slide. The only physical thing here are the two photons. These photons could be in very different locations. I'll draw the wave, but the wave has no you know, time or space uh, existence. All right, so to explain a little bit what this phenomenon allows us to do, let me describe an experiment to you. So I'll, I'll describe it in very high level terms. I'm gonna take these two particles or photons, put them very far apart and put each of them in a box. Each of these boxes represents some physical apparatus that can make observations on the photons. Uh, each box has three different buttons, uh, R1, R2, R3, C1, C2, C3. Uh, these represent buttons that I can push. Each time I put a button, some observation is make on the, made on the physical system. Like we check the speed, the angular momentum, the spin, whatever. So now this experiment is such that it has certain properties that I'm going to describe to you. Uh, when you press any of the R buttons, a, as output of the experiment, you get just three bits. Uh, in this example, 0, 1, 1. Uh, there's just one property that these bits have is that their parity is always even. Okay, 0 plus 1 plus 1 is 2. 2 is an even number. Uh, now I pressed R2. If I pressed R3, uh, you know, it could get a different outcome, but again, it's, uh, it's even. Actually, I drew the same outcome, but it could have been different. All right, so whenever I press any of the three buttons there, three bits come out, even parity. On the right-hand side, it's the same. I get three bits, but I arrange them in a column, and they always have odd parity. I press C1, C2, C3, I always get bits that have odd parity. These are just the outcomes of my experiment. Now, there's one more property that I need to tell you about, is that um, because these two boxes are very far apart, I can imagine one in the moon, one here, we could press a button on each of them. And here's where entanglement comes in. Uh, entanglement says that for this specific experiment, the outcomes of the two boxes are going to be correlated in the following way. If you put them together, um, like this, uh, in a square, uh, here you have a row, okay, so R1, R2, R3 stands for first row, second row, third row. So here I press R3, I got a row, I just drew the same one here. This C2 stands for second column, I put it here. You can see this one here matches this one, okay, I got the same value here, all right? So this will happen whatever buttons you press. So just give you another example. I could press R1, get an even parity string, C1, get an odd parity string. I put them in my square, the zero here, which is the first column in the first row, these zeros match, all right? So this is an experiment that you can do and, uh, and entanglement just describes these correlations. Uh, it's an experiment that's actually been done for a while since the, the 80s. This is a lab in, in France of Alain Spé. Uh, Delft, and uh, just a couple of years ago, an experiment like this was done through satellites. So you have to imagine the satellite beaming the photons. One goes to a certain city, the other goes into a certain city. In each city, you have someone like making the box, pressing the button, and bam, they see these zeros and ones, such that they always match in the way that I described. Okay, now I want to tie back to my idea of randomness. So I'm going to make a claim here, which is that however this experiment is performed, in order to generate bits that satisfy all the constraints that I described to you, you must do it randomly, okay? So if anyone is kind of like mathematically inclined here, like try to follow me a little bit. Uh, suppose this is the one technical slide of the talk. Uh, suppose not, okay? Suppose I had a way to like program these boxes such that whenever I press the buttons, it, whatever constraints are written on the slide are always satisfied, okay? If this were the case, I could press all the buttons, okay? Let's press the first button, the second, the third, and we'd get three rows and all of them satisfy the parity constraint. You can even, even, even. And the other one, I could press the three buttons. Because it's deterministic, there's a you know, specific outcome that comes whenever I press the button, I just draw it. So odd, uh, <laughs> whoa, I got it wrong. So these columns somehow are supposed to be odd. I'm sorry, imagine that they're odd. Sorry about that. So just remove this one and remove this one, whatever. Um, now, there was also this uh, matching intersection constraint on them, right? So when it, whenever a row and a column intersect, they should have the same value. In other words, these two squares should be the same. All right, so now you can try to think a little bit, is this possible? Can I draw a square such that each row has even parity and another square, square such that each column has odd parity and these two squares would be the same? All right, that's not possible. I don't know if anyone got it. Why is it not possible? 
If all the rows have even parity, when I add up every one, I get an even number. If all the columns have odd parity, when I add up every one, odd plus odd plus odd is odd. Okay, so this one needs to have all the numbers be even, sum to even, this one needs to sum to odd. They cannot be the same, all right? So there does not exist a deterministic experiment that produces uh, numbers uh, as in this box. However, quantum mechanically, it is possible. Uh, how is that possible? Uh, the only way in which it would be possible is that every time I press two buttons, one on the left box and one on the right, the outcomes that I get are generated randomly. They're generated uh, on the fly. I got here even, I got here odd. These things match if you put them in the third row and the third column. Uh, however, there is no way to press all the button and get consistent things. The reason is that these are outcomes of a measurement that's performed with my particles. These measurement generates outcomes that have randomness in them. And once the measurement has been performed, the wave function has collapsed um, and there's nothing left uh, to measure. So I can reset my particles and do the experiment a second time, but it won't be consistent uh, with the first time. So this feature of entanglement gives us a solution uh, to certifying the randomness present in quantum mechanics. Uh, here's a simple uh, experiment you could make. You just set up the boxes and you repeatedly perform uh, this, uh, this operation of uh, check, choosing a row, choosing a column, and you do it over and over again. And if the constraints of parity and uh, matching intersections are always satisfied, then you know by the proof that I gave you uh, that these outcomes have been generated uh, randomly. So I give you a very simple idea uh, how to use entanglement in order to certify randomness. Now this is an idea that can be bootstrapped into much more uh, complex uh, verification tasks and some things that my collaborators and I are working on is in using uh, similar ideas based on entanglement in order to develop protocols uh, that can be used to uh, test and certify and verify uh, big quantum computation and communication networks, uh, such as the future quantum cloud uh, that people have started uh, to think about. Uh, all right, so let me uh, end here. Uh, I'm uh, very grateful uh, to the Blavatnik uh, Foundation for, uh, for this award and to the uh, New York Academy of Science and the Israel Academy of Science of Humanities for, for giving me this opportunity to, uh, to talk in front of you. Uh, so thanks. So another area in which uh, verification is not known to be doable easily are neural nets. Uh, uh -huh. Neural nets. Is there anything in these uh, in these combinatorial mathematical ideas that allow you to uh, verify uh, quantum uh, computing uh, applicable to uh, neural nets? Not that I know. So I mean, this is a this is a question. Or you know how to. Um, verify uh, or certify the behavior of, uh, of, a, of a neural network or like a model that has been trained. Uh, there's definitely lots of uh, mathematical and cryptographic ideas that can go into, into that. Uh, I don't know about quantum computing yet. Um, this is one uh, interesting area of research for quantum computing, which is uh, quantum machine learning. So you can also do uh, quantum analogs with these neural nets. Uh, at the moment, though, uh, because we don't yet have the quantum computers, it's a little bit hard to experiment and gain insights into what the advantage there might be. So this is a little bit behind, but it's uh, uh, but it's a good direction for for future for future research. Thanks. Thank you. One more question. Um, thank you for your talk, Thomas. So I've been listening to um, people from different disciplines talk about quantum computing. I heard the head of research at IBM talk about developing their quantum computers, mm -hmm. and he thinks they're going to be ready for the prime time within five or 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, and then a few months ago, I listened to a, um, a theoretical physicist talk about quantum, and he said not in our lifetime. Um, from your perspective and your, <coughs> your study, when do you think it's feasible that we'll have a quantum computer that surpasses our current, um, the computing power of, of current computers? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, notoriously hard to make these kinds of predictions. In fact, you know, it's, there's, ever since I joined the field, it's always been, you know, in five or 10 years, and I've been around for some time. Um, uh, but, uh, but actually, I think this is wrong, and um, I think that it'll happen 
uh, quicker than, than we think. It definitely from, from my point of view, and it's been, what, like maybe 15 years that I do this or 20 years, it, things have changed in a very, very, very noticeable uh, way. It used to be that as computer scientists, we made jokes about, uh, you know, one qubit or two qubit computers factoring 15 or something. And we're like, oh, okay, they factored 15. Yeah, okay, but they had to bake in the solution because the computer wouldn't have figured it out by yourself. And this has completely changed. Uh, now we're not making these jokes anymore. And um, there is a big challenge of, um, you know, making the machine stable uh, and making it resistant to errors. People have many creative ideas there, but it's it's still extremely challenging to uh, to scale things up. Yeah, I, I think IBM is optimistic, but, but you know, of course, it's their business, so you can you can blame them for it. And I'm surprised by the physicist answer. I, I would definitely not say not in my lifetime. I definitely count on on seeing these machines. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, yeah, so I don't know if he was talking about his or her <laughs> lifetime. Let's not, uh, let's hope that they also see it. Um, it's hard to say, but I think that we're seeing very interesting things now. And in fact, I, I personally know a number of physicists who do believe that they have made significant discoveries in their work by experimenting with quantum systems. So these are not things that you can say, well, okay, I mean, it's a like, complete foolproof demonstration of an advantage because it's a little bit specialized and you can always say, well, but what if something? But they believe that they are making discoveries and I think this is going to get out of the lab, um, you know, soon, like, yeah. Say, if you had to guess, would you say 20 years? Um, I mean, no, I don't mind making ambitious guesses, like as long as you're not, you know, um, no, I would say less. So, um, yeah, um, things are moving very fast and uh, sometimes they move faster than uh, than people expect. I mean, this also happened in machine learning and uh, and uh, I think it could happen in quantum computing. Once a lot of effort is put, uh, is put into it, uh, you can definitely have uh, phase transitions. And so I wouldn't be surprised if it was far less than 20 years, let me say it this way. Thank you very much, Thomas. Thanks.